This week was a, was a pretty awesome week, actually. There was a, if you got to see some pictures on Facebook, there was a massive set up here, and, uh, which, was, which was done incredibly well. Uh, I know Donnie and Kirsty were uh, instrumental in getting that together, and several others as well, but you guys did just an awesome job, and I just want to say thank you to everyone who was here and volunteered and was a part of VBS. Seeds were sown, lives were changed, as we heard. I mean, if it... All this work that went into it, if one person got saved, it was worth it. And nine people got saved. So that's incredible. That is incredible. So praise God. Thank you, God, for that. That's awesome. I believe also uh, Dusty was telling me that we had, it was either 104 or 107 kids that showed up, which ties our largest uh, amount that we've had in the eight or nine years that we've been doing this, which was pretty incredible considering there were other VBSs going on and other camps going on. And so we weren't sure how many people were going to show up. So it was, it was, it was a really awesome time. And so uh, VBS was great. I got to be the professor in the play and I got to wear these glasses which is why I'm wearing them today. I thought about wearing my lab coat, but it's way too hot. And actually, really, I'm wearing these. It's, it's, it's twofold reason. I was out in the sun a little bit yesterday, and, and I got kind of a, a little bit of a tan line here. So I didn't know what would be more distracting, wearing the glasses or looking at the tan line. So, uh, so we're going with glasses today. Um, uh, so, uh, also, I want to give you an update uh, on our building fund. Uh, last time we talked, which was the beginning of June, it was down to $197,000, which is awesome. And as of this today, our most recent payment, it's down to 166, I believe. So, very great, awesome, 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 awesome. Continuing to go down in Jesus' name, and we are a debt-free church. I believe that and confess it. So anyway, I just wanted to give you a little bit of an update, what's going on. Uh, this week was, was pretty great. It was exhausting. It's very tiring, but totally worth it. I, always, I was talking to Marley, and I said, you know, thinking about VBS, like going into it, I'm always like, oh, this is going to be so much. But then once I'm going through it and afterward, I'm like, that was so worth it. It was. It was a lot of fun. We had a great time. So next year, if you're interested in thinking about it, you should be a part of it. It is a blast. Um, all right, let's get, be, let's, let's get beginning here. Um, we've been in the middle of a sermon series titled 490, if you can see that here, subtitled Freedom and Forgiveness. I just want to review uh, quickly about what we've been talking about. Week one, we talked about understanding forgiveness, and we talked about what what forgiveness is and also what it is not. It's easier sometimes to say what forgiveness isn't than to even say what it is, similar to love in that fashion. So we talked about that. We, 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 we dove deep into that. I'm giving you a 10,000 foot view today, this morning. Uh, we talked about uh, some scriptures that talked about forgiving as you have been forgiven. We talked about uh, when, when Peter asked Jesus, hey, how many times am I supposed to forgive my brother, right? The dude that wrongs me all the time. Seven times, as many as seven? And Jesus says, no, no, 70 times seven, and which is where we get our title, 490. And I don't believe that that is a literal number of 490 that we're keeping track, and you know, you're at 487 right now, so be careful not to wrong me within the next 30 minutes or else, well... Then I get to slap you across the face. In good Christian love, suddenly he laid hands upon him. <laughs> I don't think that that's what that means, but um, anyway, I think Jesus was, was, was essentially saying, look, it's, it's not just seven times. It's 70 times seven. It's 700 times seven. It's 7,000 times seven. It's, it's, it's you walk in forgiveness because this is what you do as a believer in Jesus Christ. This is what we do as Christians. And so... We talked about that, and we talked about how Jesus is the ultimate picture of forgiveness, and how as he's, he's on the cross and he's dying, in the middle of all of that, he says, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. See, Jesus had already purposed in his heart to forgive. He had already forgiven them. He didn't say, Father, I forgive them for what they're doing because they don't know what they're doing. He said, Father, you forgive them for they don't know what they're doing. 
you know, I have a, I have a daughter, I'm about to have a son, and, and if they were killing, if someone was killing my child, that would really upset me. Really upset me. And for my child to sit here and turn and say, Dad, forgive them, they don't know what they're doing. Man, that's, that's an ultimate picture of forgiveness right there. And that's exactly what Jesus did. He had already purposed in his heart, I'm forgiving them. Father, please, you forgive them as well. And so we talked about that. We talked about Jesus being the ultimate picture of forgiveness. That was in week one. In week two, we talked about forgiving yourself. We talked about how oftentimes, I use myself as an example here, that I'm a firstborn and I've set high expectations for myself. And sometimes, sometimes, I don't always reach those expectations about how, how we know what we have been called to be and what we are called to look like as Christians and how sometimes we don't always 100% walk that out. Sometimes we, we just miss the mark. And a lot of times what will happen in that case is that we begin to beat ourselves up. We're so frustrated with, I should have done this or I could have done this or why didn't I do this or why did I do this again? And these kinds of things begin to play in our minds. And we talked about that and how Ultimately, what that does is that becomes, it, it, it makes us sin conscious and not God conscious. We talked about how in scripture there really isn't anything about forgiving yourself. Forgiving yourself is not something that is scriptural. But what we do instead of forgiving ourselves is we learn to receive Christ's forgiveness because Christ is enough. And when he says, I forgive you, that should be enough. Because when I don't forgive myself, then I'm putting a qualifier on top of that saying, well, yeah, Jesus, your forgiveness is great, but I still have to forgive myself. What we have to learn how to do is to receive Christ's forgiveness because it is good enough. His sacrifice was good enough. We talked about how in those moments of weakness, that's when God's power is made perfect in our lives. How we don't like moments of weakness. I don't like, I don't like moments of weakness in my life. But it's in those times that God's power is made perfect and we talked about how it's not about you. About how when we become sin focused, it becomes about us and it's not about us, it's about him. Remember we just sang that it's all about you, Jesus. So I'm praying for a refocusing for us and our hearts on him, our eyes on him. Amen. That was week two. In week three, last week, we talked about forgiving others. We talked about the, the when we should forgive others and why we should forgive others. And it, do you remember I had a backpack full of rocks? They weren't really full of rocks, but otherwise I've been like this by the end of service. <laughs> but carrying a backpack full of rocks and how when I walk in unforgiveness, it's like carrying a backpack full of rocks about how it affects no one else but, it, but myself. And the question is, when do I take that thing off? When do I let that thing go? And sometimes, a lot of times, we wait on someone else to help us. We're waiting on an apology or a repentance or some contrition or some, give me some reason to forgive you. And in that moment, that's when they help us take it off. But reality is this, we have to be people who, we don't need other people's help to take off the unforgiveness. We have to purpose in our hearts to be forgivers. And how we have to say, you know what, I'm gonna take this off. It doesn't matter if you apologize. It doesn't matter if you're sorry. I am choosing to forgive you anyway, just like Jesus did on the cross when he was being murdered. And, that when, and th that's when we do it. We don't have to wait for them. We don't have to wait for an apology. We do it now. Go ahead and do it now. We talked about that last week. Uh, but ultimately, throughout all of it, we've had one simple phrase uh, that kind of sums everything up, and it's this. Release them and you will be set free. Does, does that sound like the past couple weeks y'all have been here? Okay, awful quiet this morning, so. You ready to wake up? Ready for this one? Ready for today? Okay, some people are. All right, this week, our t uh, we had VBS, right? I told you we had VBS. And our theme was time lab discovery which is why I was a professor. I got to be a scientist professor. And what he did was he built a time machine, right? So I was thinking about that last night, and uh, I thought, man, wouldn't it be cool to have a real life time machine? It would be kind of neat to be able to, I mean, if nothing else, just to go back in time to be there when, when events were transpiring. Right? Like to be around people, some, some momentous times in, in history, signing of the Declaration of Independence, you know, uh, Gettysburg Address. 
going back to 2012 when Kentucky won the title. <laughs> or 98 or 96 or 78 or 58 or... <laughs> Those would be good, to, I mean, the, or, you know, maybe, maybe we would want to go back and change something in history, in, in our own personal history, you know, like Kentucky losing to Wisconsin and for a perfect season. And maybe someone could, I don't know, lock the locker room and make them forfeit Wisconsin. So I don't know. No, but think about this. What if you had a, a time machine? Would you want to go back in time to, to not just experience history, but maybe to change something in your own personal lives? Not, not something big in the course of history, but would you want to go change something? Maybe like fix a decision that you made. You know, maybe you decided to go to one college and hindsight, you're like, I really should have stayed home or I really should have gone away. Or, or maybe, maybe it's a relationship with someone. Like you had a relationship and, and they were the one that got away. And you're like, man, if only. Or maybe you just want to fix a bad decision that you made. Like I should not have eaten that sushi. That was not good. That was the worst thought of my life changing things that happen to us, fixing stuff, maybe bad choices that we've made. But having a time machine, that would be kind of cool. The reality of it is this, is that we don't have a time machine. We can't go back in time. Professor has not invented it yet. So unfortunately, things that happened, they happened. And, and sometimes, well not sometimes, we always, we have to live with the decisions that we have made. But it's not just that. I think also we would probably go back in time, many of us, I know myself, I'll, I'll use myself in this example, would like to go back in time and maybe change something, not that, that we did, but maybe something that happened to us. Like maybe there was something that really hurt us. Maybe there was something, maybe it was a loved one, maybe it was a friend, maybe it was uh, just a, a, a bad day that happened, but something that, that really cut, that really marked, that really is ingrained within us, and it was a deep hurt. Maybe we want to change something like that. I'm sure everybody in here can probably pick out a moment in time in their lives that something like that has happened. And you can think about, man, if I could only just change this moment. We can't change that moment, we understand, but it's kind of what I want to talk about today is how things happen in our lives and there are many times that things happen and we just, we don't understand why they happen, but they do and how we often want to change those things, but really one of the, the biggest things that we do is we ask the question, why? Why did this happen to me? Why did this happen in my life? Why did he have a stroke? Why did he die? Why did she leave me? Why did, insert whatever you want to insert. Why did this bad thing happen to me? I'm a good person. In those times, especially in tragedy, one of the very common phrases or sayings, and it's said with, with good intentions, it is, but it's one of, my, one of my pet peeves and one of my least favorites is, is that, well, God has a plan. God has a plan. And I, I agree with that statement. I, I agree that God does have a plan for all of our lives. I also understand that plans, you don't always follow those plans. Just because there's a plan there does not mean I have to follow those plans. Just because I have a set of instructions on how to create a dollhouse does not mean I follow those instructions. Sometimes I think that I'm okay enough or I know enough or I'm smart enough to figure it out myself. Sometimes that happens. We have a lot of confidence in our own abilities. You know, God, I don't really need you. I don't really need your plan. I got mine down. I mean, I got my five-year plan, my 10-year plan. I know exactly where I'm going. I don't really need to listen to you or hear what you have for my life. Or maybe I have heard your plan. I know your plan, and I don't really like it. Because it requires something of me that, well, maybe it's a little more than I want to give. 
It's this very real scenario. So I do believe that God has a plan for your life. I don't believe that we always follow those steps. I don't believe that we always listen. And I do believe this, that there are things that happen in our lives that we can't always explain. I would like to be able to explain every single thing that happened. Every re- this happened because of this reason. This happened because of this reason. This happened because of this reason, whether it's good or bad. But the reality is this, we, we, we can't. We, we can't because we don't know. We don't know. We can't explain everything that happens, but we, we would like to. Am I right? Would you like to have an explanation of everything that's happened in your life? Why did this happen? Why did this happen, I, right? I might not want to have that explanation. The reality is this, that there is nobody, I'm gonna use a double negative here, there is nobody on earth that hasn't suffered to some extent. Everybody on earth has suffered to some extent. It may be something small, it may be something large. It may have been something way in the past, it may be something very recent. But everyone has walked through something. And we all like to ask the question, why? Father, why? And God, why did this happen? I'm a Christian, I'm a believer. Why did this happen to me? I thought you would keep me, God. I thought you would watch over me. Why did this happen to me? Why did this bad thing happen to me? I have news for you today that even though you're a believer in Jesus Christ, or you may not be, but specifically I'm talking to Christians this morning, being a Christian does not make you exempt from bad things happening to you. There's countless examples in scripture. Just looking at the apostles alone, think about that for a minute, they were beaten. Many, some were shipwrecked. I've never been shipwrecked in my life. I may have felt like that emotionally, but not actually shipwrecked. I've never been imprisoned, specifically for my faith. And I'm standing before you today, which means I'm not dead, I am not a martyr. The reality is this, that yes, we are believers in Jesus Christ, and yes, scripture says I will never leave you nor forsake you, but it does not say that things will not happen to us. It says that no weapon formed against you shall prosper. Weapons will be formed against you. We will walk through trials. In fact, James tells us that when we do walk through trials, we need to count it as joy, which is why I think it's important for us to look back on the examples of the apostles. What did they do in these situations? When things didn't go the way that they wanted them to go, when bad things happened to them, what did they do? Paul writes in 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 8, it says, we are afflicted in every way, but not crushed. Perplexed, but not driven to despair. Persecuted, but not forsaken. Struck down, but not destroyed. Here's where I'm going today. Bad things happen to good people. Bad things happen to bad people. Bad things happen to Christians. Bad things happen to atheists. Bad things happen. Bad things happen. Things, we're gonna walk through trials in our lives. And if somebody told you that you're not gonna walk through a trial, then, well, I'm sorry. That's not right. We will walk through trials. The good news is we have someone who will walk with us through those trials. That's such a, that's the blessing to it. But what happens a lot of times is, is that when we walk through something that is bad that we don't like and we can't explain why, one of the first things that we do is we resort to blaming God. I don't understand why this is happening to me. God, why did you allow this to happen? God, why is this happening? This makes no sense to me. Why is this happening? And because we don't understand, we look for something or someone to blame. Typically, it's not ourselves. That's the last place we look, right? (laughs) 
we want to blame somebody or something, so a lot of times we resort to blaming God. So today I want to talk about forgiving God. And I say that in quotes. Because I believe that, I don't believe that God has anything to be forgiven of. I believe that he is guiltless. But I believe that, that <laughs> we have to release him so that we can be set free. So in reality, it's not me forgiving God, it's me not blaming him for things that happen in my life that I don't understand. So to start, I wanna say this, that we can't be governed by our limited perception of God and the things that happen to and around us. Because really that's, to me it seems like that's what it's born out of. Because I don't understand, and because I don't understand you fully, God, I'm gonna blame you. I'm gonna blame you. So I have a question for you. Do you know everything there is to know about God? Do you know everything there is to know about eternity? Do you know everything that there is to know about mankind? I think the answer is a resounding no, am I right? Do we have anybody in here who knows all that? If you are, come see me, let's talk about that, because I gotta hear some things, I gotta know. We don't. Does God? I think that's a resounding yes. So to me right there, that's end of discussion. I don't know. You do. I don't know. You do. I don't know, but you do. God does know. And sometimes in our frustration of not knowing, we get upset with God. We have to to find someone to blame, something to blame, so we get upset with God and, and, you know, do you think that God gets upset with us when we're upset with him? I don't think so, I don't think so, and I liken it to this. I have a two-year-old daughter, and she loves to play, and she loves to watch TV, and she loves to do all of the things that she wants to do. But there comes a time every night where daddy says, Kylie, it's time to go to bed. And she doesn't really like that. And she may throw a fit, she may be upset, because she wants to do what she wants to do. And she doesn't understand that, well, she needs to go to bed, This is good for you. It's healthy for you. You need to go to sleep. And she gets mad at me, and she may throw a fit. Do I get mad at her for throwing a fit at me? No. In fact, I expect it because she's a child, and she doesn't know any better. She doesn't know any better until she's been taught that this is not an okay way to behave. You can be upset about this, You can be frustrated about this, but I'm not upset with you for not knowing, for being a child, for being ignorant. You're a kid. And I'm not upset that she's mad at me. Of course she wants to keep playing. Of course she wants to have fun and do all those things. And I want her to have fun. And I want her to play. But there comes a time where she's got to go take a nap. She's got to go night-night. And I expect that to be her response. And one day, that will change. One day, she'll be happy to go to bed. (laughs) One day, someone will say, hey, you want to go take a nap? She'll be like, oh, thank you. I thought you'd never ask. (laughs) I just spent so much time at VBS, I'm ready. (laughs) One day... As she grows and matures, she will get to a place where she is okay with that. And in the same way that I, as a father, know my child and know her responses and know what she's going to do, so does our Heavenly Father. I mean, He created us, right? He knows everything there is to know about mankind in eternity. He knows that we have weaknesses, he knows that we have frustrations, and he knows that we don't know everything, even though we may think that we do. 
no matter how many books we've read or how many sermon series we've went through. And he knows that we get frustrated and I don't think that he is upset with us for being upset. I think that he understands and I think that there's a really good example of this in John chapter 11, if you would turn with me here. We're gonna start in verse 28. This is a story about Lazarus. Lazarus was Jesus' friend, and he was sick, and Jesus said, don't worry, it's not a big deal, and Jesus was away. Long story short, Lazarus dies while Jesus is away. So we're gonna pick up here in verse 28. It says this, when she had said this, she went and called her sister Mary, saying in private, the teacher is here and is calling for you. And when she heard it, she rose quickly and went to him. Now Jesus had not yet come into the village, but was still in the place where Martha had met him. When the Jews who were there and with her in her house, consoling her, saw Mary rise quickly and go out, they followed her, supposing that she was going to the tomb to weep. Now when Mary came to where Jesus was and saw him, she fell at his feet, saying to him, Lord, If only you had been there, my brother would not have died. When Jesus saw her weeping and the Jews who had come with her were also weeping, he was deeply moved in his spirit and he was greatly troubled. And he said, where have you laid him? They said, Lord, come and see. And Jesus wept. I think that's actually, it's the shortest scripture in the Bible, Jesus wept. But I think it's also a very profound scripture. Jesus wept. So the Jews said, see how he loved him? But some of them said, could not he who opened the eyes of the blind man also have kept this man from dying? I'm gonna stop there. See, everybody thinks that they've got it all figured out. Right, you've got Mary and Martha and these Jews who said, Jesus, if you had just been there, if you had walked according to my plan, then this wouldn't have even happened. If you had just been, I mean, you you could open the eyes of the blind. Couldn't you save him? Everybody, they had their own responses. They had their own reasons. And Jesus very, very easily could have responded from a defensive position. He could have said, yeah, you're right. I am the son of God and I can do this. Bang. He very much could have done that. He very much could have engaged in a discussion back and forth of he said, she said, why didn't you, why couldn't you, I did this, and this was my reasoning for doing that. He could have done that very, very easily, but he didn't. What did he do? He wept. He felt. He hurt with those who were grieving. I think that's really important because to me that shows One, Jesus lost somebody that he loved. Lazarus was a friend of Jesus. So it touched him and it troubled him and it it touched him deeply. Jesus knows, scripture tells us that Jesus knows what we've gone through. He knows what we walk through. Jesus lost a loved one. He's been there. And he hurt and he wept. And I think in that Because of that, we can say that God knows us. He knows what we're going through. He knows what we're feeling. He knows the hurt that's inside. He knows the frustrations that we may have. He understands that. He gets that. Because Mary and Martha, they were not happy with Jesus. They were upset with him. If only you had been here. You know, I know there have been times in my life where I've had this conversation to myself, God, why didn't you, I don't get it. Why weren't you here? Why didn't you do, why didn't you do what your word says? Why, why didn't you, I don't understand. I'm sure I'm not alone in this room. I'm sure many of us have had that conversation. God, I don't get it. If you had shown up on time, if you had shown up on my time, Maybe things could be differently. You know what? Your t- I don't like your, your timing is terrible, God. It's just, just 
horrible. If only you'd been here. I thought you were God. I thought you could do anything. Why couldn't you stop this? I've had that, that. Those are words directly out of my own mouth. God, I don't get it. I don't understand. Just like my daughter when she throws a fit with me. When things happen to her that she doesn't like or want. You have the power to allow me to stay up later, Dad. You have the authority to extend my bedtime. Why didn't you do that? It's what I wanted. I think God knows us. And the rest of the story goes something like this. Lazarus was raised from the dead. God was glorified ultimately in all of it. And that was something that was not even on the mind of those who were weeping in that moment that he would be raised from the dead. And my point is this. We don't always understand what God is gonna turn, even when bad things happen, how he can take and turn something into good. Because scripture tells us that he works things together for good to those who love God and are called according to his purpose. If you're a child of God, you're called according to his purpose. And if we believe and if we trust in him, then even when bad things happen to us and we don't understand those things that are happening, even when we think it should be another way, I can stand here and say, no, God, I'm gonna trust you. I still believe that you're faithful even though I cannot see it because I walk by faith and not by sight. Because even though I'm walking through crap that sucks, I'm gonna trust you. I'm going to trust you through it all. And I'm not gonna blame you for everything that happens to me. Because it doesn't always turn out the way that we think that it should. But I think that we have to get to a place where we can trust God enough to forgive him. To not blame him when things happen in our lives that we don't like or even agree with. When we don't forgive God, this will almost certainly have a negative effect on our relationships with people. very likely we will have a a, a problem forgiving people as well. Because bitterness begins to well up inside of us. I'm angry with God. I'm not receiving his love. And so out of that, that's what I am now distributing out of my own bitterness, out of my own frustrations. So when somebody else wrongs me, my response is maybe not that of a Christ-like response. But totally forgiving God means setting him free. Remember, release them and you will be set free. Even when horrible things have happened to you. And if you do this, then your life will be changed. I promise you. Because you can hold on to it and you can hold on to it and you can hold on to it and you can carry that backpack. That backpack is not just applicable to other people. It's also applicable to God. And if I hold on to that backpack of rocks because I'm blaming God for something that has happened in my life, that's gonna be a a hard road to tell. So, how do we go about forgiving God? Here's my recommendations. Number one, first of all, air out the hurt that you have. Air out the complaint that you have with him. God, this is what, this is how I feel. I'm angry. I'm frustrated. I don't like this at all. I'm sad. I'm hurting. This is what's going on inside of me. And I don't like it. I want to forgive you, but this is what I'm struggling with right now. Psalms tells us that David did this. He, 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 he brought his complaints to the Lord. He aired it out. He said, look, this is what's going on. This is what I'm dealing with. And I think that's very appropriate. Just the same as if we had a wrong with a, a, a brother or a sister. We would go to them and say, hey, look, you may not know this, but this, this is how I'm feeling. And I, I really want to work this out. I, I want to figure this out because I can't hold on to this. I think God wants us to talk 
to him about our issues, what we're having, not just our problems that we have, but the things that are going on within us, to submit those to him and, and, and then see what happens, because it's a good thing that happens. But the key here, I think, is this. Talk to him about it, not to the rest of the world about it. Because it's very easy for me to get on Facebook and write this massive rant about how I'm feeling because this is what's going on in my life and this is what is the frustrating point and God, I'm angry with you about this, 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 and this. I can easily go air out my laundry with someone else and with the world, but I think what God wants is for us to air that out with him. So first of all, talk with him. Air out your complaints. Secondly, I think this is a really good suggestion, one that I like to do whenever I'm feeling upset or down, and that's make a list of all the things that I'm thankful for. When I'm hurting and when I'm frustrated, when I'm walking through something, my focus is on that, right? I'm focused on the hurt or the pain that has been caused to me. But if I can change that focus onto the things that I'm actually thankful for, like I'm standing here breathing today, that's one very simple thing. You know, that I have a, a family or a wife, whatever it is, everyone has something to be thankful for. Especially in this room, you all have clothes today, no one's naked, that's a good thing. It'd be incredibly distracting if you weren't, or if you didn't have clothes. So be thankful for that. You can find things that you're thankful for, but I think it's important because what that does is it shifts our focus off of the hurt and the pain after I've aired this thing out and on to the things to be thankful for. God, I, I am thankful that I'm breathing today. I am thankful that I'm here. I, I have a job. I have a family. I have a house or a car, whatever, something. Make a list of things that you're thankful for. Third, fight the spirit of self-pity and entitlement by reading scripture and worshiping. Again, this is another focus kind of an issue. I'm taking the focus off of myself. I wanna read your word. I wanna see what your word says, especially in these kinds of moments. I wanna read about the apostles and what they went through. How, what did they do? Well, they were in jail and they began to pray and they began to praise and they began to worship. Maybe I should do the same. Maybe when I'm walking through a trial in my life, I need to turn my focus off the trial and onto you. Maybe I need to begin to praise. Maybe I be, need to, 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 to let go of the self-pity, to, to let go of the entitlement, to let go of the pride, because that's what comes out of self-pity and entitlement, is pride and bitterness. I'm coming back to a heart of worship. It's all about you. And finally, number four, be patient. Quite possibly the hardest of, the, of all of them. Be patient and believe that God can work all things together for good. That even though I may not see it right now, at the very least, it will become a part of my testimony. And I can share that with others and help to encourage them in those same kinds of times. Because I remember when I was walking through being blind, I remember when I was walking through having AFib, being in the hospital, being scared. And in those moments, I didn't know why I was going through this. Why do I have to have a corneal transplant weeks before I'm getting married? That stinks. I don't like being in excruciating pain. I don't like these things. And in the moment, you can't see that, no pun intended. In the moment, you don't understand what's going on and why this is happening, but God can take something that has happened to you, because remember this, this is very key. This is why we don't blame God, because scripture tells us that Jesus comes to steal, to kill, and to destroy. What? No. The thief comes to steal and to kill and to destroy, but Jesus came for what? Life. 
and to give it abundantly. Because see, everything that happens to us that is bad, we, we want to blame God, but the reality is this. We live in a fallen world. Bad things happen. Satan is ruler over this world. And we're to be the light in the world, drawing men to him as we lift him up. Even when we walk through trials, even when we walk through the hardest parts in life, even when we're down in the mud, we're down in the valleys, we have to lift up Jesus. Because it's not him that puts, puts these things upon us. It's him who redeems and lifts us out of those things that are upon us. And if we recognize that, then we don't begin to blame God. We begin to thank God and say, thank you, thank you, thank you. It could have been so much worse but I'm choosing to bless your name. I'm choosing to praise you. To the God who gives and takes away, the God who gives life and takes away pain. Don't flip flop those. We won't always get the answer that we want. We're not always ready for that answer. We're not often in a place that we can handle that answer. In the same way, I don't allow Kitely to drive us to church in the morning. She's two. She's not there yet, but one day she will be. One day God may reveal to you that you were spared from this, or this happened, or this happened, and this is how I saved your life. I remember one time, quick story, I was with my parents, we were driving to church and the Lord spoke to my mom and said, no, you need to take this long route. I don't want to take that long route. That's longer. It inconveniences me. No, you need to take this long route. And she did. Come to find out, I believe it was a train that hit a car or a massive car accident that was, would have been right at the same exact time we were rock, driving through there. You, you just don't always know So we can't blame God. We need to release him. We need to forgive God. Amen? Amen. Amen. Remember this. Three last things, and we'll be finished this evening, or this morning. It feels like this evening. (laughs) (laughs) Haven't gotten much sleep this week, so. Number one, forgiveness is a conscious choice. You must make the decision to forgive today. Number two, resolve to trust and praise God even when you don't have your answers. Purpose in your heart, Lord, I'm gonna forgive you and I'm gonna trust you and I'm gonna release it because I'm not gonna hold on to this and I'm not gonna blame you for the things that happened to me. I'm going to trust you. I don't understand and that's okay. That's okay because I know that you are the God who holds the universe and I know that you know everything. And I'm okay with not knowing everything. Number three, and finally, release him and you'll be set free. Amen. Stand with me this morning. We're gonna pray. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Father. Lord, we are thankful today. Father, we're thankful that we we do have life and we do have breath, we have our being and movement in you, that we're able to even gather here and worship you, that we live in a place that we are free to do this. Father, that we aren't persecuted. Lord, I just thank you for your incredible grace that you have, your love for us, your mercy for us, your patience with us. Father, when we act like children and we don't understand and we're frustrated and angry with you, I thank you for being patient and understanding with us. And I just declare this morning that we are a people who are growing and maturing in you. Father, that we are filled with your wisdom and your understanding. Lord, that we are patient people. We know what that means. Father, that when we do walk through trials in life, when when we do go through things that we don't like, Father, we thank you for being there, for the Holy Spirit guiding and directing our steps as we walk through the muck. 
And I just pray for your strength for anyone in here this morning who is going through these kinds of situations right now. If you're here today and you're walking through something that is challenging, that's frustrating, that's, that hurts, Father, I pray that you be the, the, the healer of the brokenhearted like you are, Lord. Holy Spirit, that you minister comfort to those who mourn and that you continue to lead us into all truth that we no longer buy into lies, that you did this to me or you did this to me, but that we know your truth and we understand and believe it and we stand in it against all lies of the enemy. Father, I do pray a hedge of protection around your people, that as we go out into the world, as we walk and live our lives, Lord, that your angels would protect us And that every plan and attack of the enemy be thwarted in Jesus' name. Father, today we release you and we repent for blaming you for anything in our lives that, that may have taken place that we just don't understand. We receive your forgiveness as it allows us to walk in forgiveness towards others. We release bitterness. I pray against that in Jesus' name. Any strongholds that are in people's lives this morning, they're broken in Jesus' name. And that we walk freely in your spirit as we go about our lives and as we go out into our mission field, the world, in Jesus' name, amen. Amen.